Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sophia Kao, the president of League of Women Voters of Southwest Santa Clara Valley. Uh, we cover the city of Los Gatos, Saratoga, Montessorino, and Campbell. Next page. Next page. So League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization established to promote the political responsibility through informed and active participation in government. So the League has two distinct roles, voter services and advocacy. The League does not support, oppose, or evaluate political candidates or parties. We do, however, after careful study, take position and advocacy on political issues. Next page. So welcome to the fourth webinar hosted by our Racial Justice Committee tonight. I'd like to thank the leadership team who could you know, coordinate and uh, make this happen. The, our Racial uh, Justice Committee, the uh, Chair Barbara Lee, our VP, Eleanor Yek, and the VP Ann Ravels. Okay, so let me introduce, yeah. Uh, let me introduce, really? Eleanor Yek is also our moderator tonight. Thank you, Sophia. Tonight's program is focused on criminal justice reform. It's actually our third program of a seven part series that our league is programming this year. Each one of our programs will be viewed, uh, an issue will be viewed through the lens of racial justice. Our first event uh, focused on identifying and defining what do we mean by racial justice and racial justice issues. And we were very pleased and excited that we were able to have Dr. Shirley Weber, our Secretary of State, be one of our speakers who actually shared personal experiences. Our second program focused on voter suppression as a racial justice issue. And our program tonight is focused on criminal justice. Certainly all of us are aware by all of the news articles that we read or that we see on TV about the issues surrounding the criminal justice system in the United States. Tonight, we are going to focus primarily on criminal justice reform here in California. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I would like to ask all of our participants to please keep yourself muted during the webinar. Please type all your questions in the chat room. You can look at the bottom of your screen and you'll see the word chat. Click on that and next to it, a box will come up and you will be able to type in your question. Towards the end of the program, all the questions will be reviewed by league members. Some of them will be grouped together and then presented to one or both or all three of our speakers after all of the presentations. Move on, please. I'm happy tonight and excited tonight that our first keynote speaker is Sharon Kyle. Sharon is a civil libertarian committed to social justice, publisher and co-founder of the LA Progressive Newsletter. She was a former president and professor of the Guild Law School. She was a member of several space flight teams at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. She's a member of the board of directors of the ACLU of Southern California, and she serves on the editorial board of the blackcommentator.com. Welcome, Sharon. We are so excited that you are here with us tonight. Thank you so much, Eleanor, and thank you committee for inviting me. I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with everyone who's really interested in this topic, because I uh, this is a topic that um, weighs heavily on the state of California. So before I begin, I'm gonna make sure that I have an opportunity to share my screen. And I do here, so I have some slides that I'd like to share with you. And uh, let me know if you are seeing go, my yeah. slides. Yes. Oh, they, yes, they're popping up. Okay. Yes. Good. yes. And now we're going to go to um, the presentation mode. Excellent. So my name is Sharon Kyle, and I put the JD there um, just to let you know that I went to law school. But there's a reason that I went to law school. I went to law school late in life. And in fact, I didn't even enroll in law school until after my youngest child was already practicing law. 
Wow. I became I became a law student for the first time at almost 50 years old. And one of the reasons I became a law student was because of the degree of um, injustice that I saw in my own personal life and in the lives of the people that I love and my friends and family that I thought was race-based. So tonight we're gonna to be taking a look at a Brave New Films documentary called uh, Racially Charged. And it's called, it's called Racially Charged for a reason. And it's called Racially Charged because what we are finding, and if anyone has read Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow, we are finding that the basis for most of our criminal justice system is very rooted in racism. So I am, in addition uh, to having gone to law school and publishing the LA Progressive, this is the, a picture of the about page of the LA Progressive, which is our digital magazine. That man there that you see is my husband. He, and, he is the editor and I am the publisher. And one of the things I figured out after marrying my husband almost 20 years ago was I was introduced into a family, my husband's family, that was very welcoming. They still are welcoming, but I got to be close and upfront and personal with a bunch of white people, which was not what I had grown up with. And what I learned was there is a vast difference between their experience in the world and the experience, my experience in the world and the experience of my family. So my husband and I were taking a trip uh, to Northern California. We were active in, we were going to a conference and we're driving up the coast and I see all of these facilities. Now for 20, more than 20 years, actually uh, almost 23 years, I worked for NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I was very deeply involved in my career and I wasn't always aware of what was going on in the general vicinity. Lo and behold, what I learned was that over the past 26 or so years, I created this chart back in, um, I think around sometime, sometime after 2000. It goes up to 2010. So yeah, I, I created this chart in 2010. So the state of California from 1852 to 1964, the state of California built 12 prisons. But then when you look from 1964 to 2010, we built 23 prisons. Mm -hmm. Now what happened? that suddenly the population of California decide, you know what, we've been law-abiding citizens all these years, well, over hundred years, but now we've decided to just go hog wild. Or do we change policies? And if you've read Michelle Alexander's book, you know that what happened was we changed policies. And by changing policies, um, things that were not necessarily defined as felonies became felonies. Um, there was uh, selective enforcement of misdemeanors. Anyway, what resulted was a dramatic increase in our prison population. So what does that have to do with misdemeanors? And I'm gonna go on to the next slide, but this is at the federal level, just to show you what has happened across the nation. We went from imprisoning about 300,000 people a year to 2.3 million. We have 5% of the world's population and we incarcerate 25% of the world's population. So prison is the only form of public housing that the government has truly invested in in the past five years, five decades. So why did this concern me? And oh, and by the way, we also have a revenue um, incentivization for various organizations to continue this practice of building prisons, constructing prisons. So what does this have to do with misdemeanors? And tonight we're watching a movie, Racially Charged Misdemeanors. Well, what this has to do with misdemeanors is that I learned that the vast majority of prisons are, uh, I'm sorry, of arrests are for misdemeanors. Across the nation, about 80%, now this is a California chart. If you look at the number of misdemeanors that uh, where we have arrests either by city police, county sheriffs, highway patrol and others, the number of misdemeanors in a year was almost a million as compared to 448,000 
um, felony arrests. And I got this information from the legislative analysts of California. They have a primer. These numbers are a bit old. Um, I grabbed this from a report from 2013. But the ratio has still remained the same in terms of the percentage of misdemeanors as compared to felony crimes. And the same is true for juveniles or adults. The vast majority of the crimes that take place in the United States where there are arrests are misdemeanor offenses. And of those misdemeanors, the vast majority of those have to do with police citizen interactions that occur in traffic stops. Wow. And if you remember, when you listen to a lot of the um, atrocities ha that have occurred with these police shootings, many of them have to do with someone being detained, either their brake flight is broken. If you can think of um, Sandra Bland, who was switching lanes and, and she ends up dead. But um, Frank um, Baumgartner, Derek Epp, and Kelsey Shaw wrote this fantastic book. I heard Kelsey uh, being interviewed on a few different podcasts, which just made me feel like, okay, we really need to investigate this because it's difficult to get the data, but somehow they were able to accumulate 20, a database with 20 million traffic stops that talk to policing and race. So the traffic stop, now this is Kansas City. What they found in Kansas City is that investor Gatory traffic stops. Those are the proactive, uh, proactive traffic stops where law enforcement will stop someone because they suspect that they have done something that um, they, they feel um, gives them the, the authority to stop them. The vast majority of the time, those stops involve Blacks and both for uh, male and female. For traffic stops that are safety stops, reactive stops where they are attempting to enforce traffic laws like running a red light or speeding, those kinds of traffic stops that are absolutely uh, public safety oriented. In those cases, there isn't a vast difference in the racial makeup of the people who are stopped. But where they are trying to investigate what they feel is some kind of suspicion of wrongdoing, this is where you see a big breakdown between the races. I have a friend, respected colleague, who's also a member of the ACLU. Her name is Dr. Kelly Lytle Hernandez. And she recently, she, in addition to her winning the MacArthur Genius Award, she heads up a department at UCLA and they were granted $3.6 million to build the age of mass incarceration database. And she's been running a department, a program called uh, Million Dollar Hoods. And what they do with Million Dollar Hoods is they are looking, what they found is that there are certain zip codes in the Southern California area where law enforcement over polices where ticketing and infractions and misdemeanors and these kinds of things soar. And then there are other uh, neighborhoods where you don't see as much of that. And so uh, UCLA was recently granted this $3.6 million grant to build this um, um, archive of LAPD records. And this is going to give those of us that are working in this area to break down the prison industrial complex. This is going to give us an opportunity to give to arm us with the information that we need to, um, to hopefully get policies to change, which is one of the things that we absolutely need is to get policies to change. Now I talked a little bit about you know, marrying my husband. And when my husband and I first got married, um, I'm gonna going, oh, let me go right here. He's, we were having a conversation and I said something to him about um, 400 years, black people in America have been under uh, the control of white people. I think maybe I said that we were enslaved for 400 years. And he quickly corrected me and said, no, you were not enslaved for 400 years. 
And I thought about that. And that conversation that I had with him prompted me to create this chart where I talk about the racially based caste systems that exist in the United States. And they certainly exist in our injustice system where 70 to 80% of the people who are currently behind bars are there for misdemeanors. They're there for lack of ability to pay cash bails. And so when you look at the origins of these injustices, we talk about slavery and we always, people say, well, why do you go back to slavery? Well, the type, the mindset that existed that allowed slavery to exist in the first place that has never been addressed. And so generally what we do and what we've done in this country is we move to one, from one form of oppression into another form of oppression. It's a sort of a whack-a-mole where you stop it here and then it pops up there. And I created this chart and lo and behold, what I found out is from 1609 all the way down to the current day, with each of these, and this is a very wordy slide, but I'll just tell you, we had slavery, then slavery is abolished. Oh, now, lo and behold, we've got the black codes. Get rid of the black codes. Whoops, now we got convict leasing and sharecropping and so on. And I will make this chart available to anyone that would like to, um, to look at it. The point being that these kinds of outcomes will continue to exist until we address our racial illiteracy and our distorted views of history. Marrying my husband helped me to see that things are actually worse than I thought they were. Um, I left my job at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I went on to law school and now we publish this um, LA Progressive where we talk a lot about this. But I just wanted to end with this slide. What we're seeing today is more of what we've seen in the past. And I thank each and every one of you who are here because what you're demonstrating is that you want to see change and change comes from learning and understanding. So thank you for spending the last 12 minutes with me. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed looking at that chart. I don't know if that's the correct word. I really found the chart informative and it did remind me of Michelle Alexander's book, uh, The New Jim Crow. When I read that book, it was just eye-opening to me uh, what I learned. And I think uh, tonight, and thank you also for mentioning the film that we're going to see, because the first time I saw this film, I was shocked. Uh, I always thought a misdemeanor was a minor little thing. And uh, I remember saying to people occasionally, well, don't worry if something's a misdemeanor, it's nothing, it's just nothing. And I found out how wrong I was to have that understanding. So we're next going to see this film uh, for our audience racially charged America's misdemeanor problem. And I will tell you that the first time I saw this, there were parts of this film that I found shocking. And uh, some of you might find it the same thing. So let's begin our film. Watching a film. We're recording. All right. Sometimes I feel like my life ended that day. My car died on the side of the road. A cop walked over to my car and asked me if I needed help, and I said no. John Clark was convicted on a misdemeanor gambling charge and was forced to work on a chain gang. I just remember being pushed, like being cornered into a wall. I was just starting out life. And I didn't think I had anything to hide. Mary Gay was sentenced to 30 days, plus court costs for stealing a hat. I was arrested that evening. It was a misdemeanor. That was the beginning of the nightmare that I had to go through. Henry Nelson was arrested for using abusive language in the presence of a female and was sent off to the coal mines. He said, you're going to jail. And I'm like, what for? Misdemeanors have historically been the chump change crimes that we didn't pay attention to. I've done nothing. 
Man, I just got beat up by the police last night. I could have lost my life. 13 million. That's about 80% of all American criminal dockets. 80% of what our criminal courts do is misdemeanors. Got him in cuffs, look. I ain't doing nothing. The story of misdemeanors is the story of law enforcement continuing to prioritize African Americans, Mexican immigrants, uh, America's so-called criminal class. Hey, you act like I really just committed a serious crime. You did I... do something illegal. You crossed the crosswalk. You might see two or three police standing here waiting for you. Cops would jump out of the van anytime, anywhere. That's what I was doing. The misdemeanor system has not gotten its fair share of blame. Misdemeanors are the invidious first step in the racialization of crime in this country. Too often, arrests for minor crimes devolve into police violence and death for black and brown people. This is a really dark story. Reconstruction was an era when four million African Americans made it out of bondage and were able to achieve at really high levels. Whether it was in business, um, in, in education, um, different ways of prosperity that really threatened white supremacy. They elected many black men to positions of power. Of course, that was a sea change from how power had been exercised during slavery. And a lot of white folks just didn't like it. They were nostalgic for the old days of overt white supremacy. And so they subverted Reconstruction. If you look at misdemeanors and you track them from the Reconstruction era to modern day, you see the fingerprints everywhere of white supremacy and control of black bodies. The land owners, they had nearly lost everything. And the only way to get that back is to somehow corral the black labor force back onto the same plantations that they had once worked. The most effective way of forcing African Americans back into this condition that would be so similar to slavery was to begin to criminalize black life itself. Misdemeanor offenses for incredibly trivial or made up things what should have been tiny penalties for non-existent offenses turn into years of people's lives. Where were you taken? I was taken out to the camps. Where did you sleep? Slept on some hay. Chain was on me. I'm being put into handcuffs. I'm being dragged into this cold space. I don't have anything to cover myself. And I'm asked to sit inside of this tiny little room, and I have no idea why I'm there. Was there any jury that tried you? No, sir. Did the recorder ask you whether you wanted a lawyer? No, sir. And I thought that I would have time to talk to a court-appointed attorney so we could talk about what happened. I could ask them to get other, you know, pieces of evidence that would prove that, hey, I'm poor. It wasn't like I was trying to run off with this money. Did they furnish any copy of the charge against you? No, sir, they did not. Did they give you any opportunity to plead to any accusation? They never gave me anything at all. When they asked me how I pled, I pled no contest. I didn't understand that no contest is the same as guilty, and that I would walk away with a misdemeanor that would affect my ability to get hired. The justice system after emancipation was weaponized against black people. It perpetuated slavery by making the mechanisms of enslavement 
pretty much the same. Family separation, back-breaking labor, people having no rights. You could be sold on the steps of the courthouse that you were convicted in and given to the highest bidder. A whole separate criminal code that applied to African-Americans was established. Many misdemeanor offenses are best understood as mechanisms of social control. They're not designed to catch dangerous or guilty people, but rather they are tools. We give them to police as additional ways of exercising their authority. Some of these laws were overtly race-based. And with others then and now, the understanding was that the laws would look race neutral, but they would be applied and enforced almost exclusively against black people. For these governments to sell prisoners into slavery, you first have to arrest lots of people. There's a big problem with that, though. There's just not enough crime for this system to work and for it to be profitable. The state governments of the South had to invent new crimes. Southern legislatures, which are essentially run by Confederates at that time, are trying to reinscribe a form of slavery through a system of laws called Black Codes. A whole category of new statutes passed in almost every Southern state that attached these enormous penalties to what were in reality very minor thefts. Those were laws and many others like it that were only ever enforced against African Americans. And so it became a way to have a basis for arresting huge numbers of black people. I don't remember much about writing the check. John Owen was caught taking six years of corn from a cornfield and was arrested under the black codes. This is four dollars and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven times four is twenty-eight dollars. So just this pile right here is how much I went to jail for. Owen was put in jail for months until he was finally tried for theft. I have his theft charge, it's theft by check. I had money in the bank, but I didn't know how long it took for checks to process. Like, I know better now. I could have donated plasma, gotten $25. Under his sentence, Owen was leased in the convict labor and sent to the chain gang, where he served two years for the corn and a third year for the court costs. I was in the Hayes County Jail for a total of 45 days for $25 worth of food. Michael Brown, who was the teenager who was killed by police in Ferguson, whose death led to the explosion of the Black Lives Matter movement, he was stopped for jaywalking. He stepped off the sidewalk and was walking in the street, and there was a local criminal ordinance that made it a crime to do so. African Americans are being cited for jaywalking at three, five, ten times the rate of white pedestrians. The legislatures of the white South make it a crime to walk alongside a railroad in an era in which there are no paved roads. The easiest way for a poor person to get from one place to another is to walk alongside a railroad. That law didn't say this only applies to black people, but those were laws that were only ever enforced against African Americans. All of us engage in what would be considered to be minor crimes. And for some people, it's crossing the street at the wrong time. But if you're black or brown, then it becomes categorized as something that's criminal. So what is I you doing? did it use a crosswalk. All I'm trying to do is go home, man. I'm tired. I just got off of work. Nandi King says he was walking home from work when it happened. I felt like they were going to draw a gun out and shoot me in my back. <laughs> I'm tired of all this shit, man! Vagrancy laws were passed that essentially meant any black person who was found on the streets unemployed and couldn't show evidence of work was a criminal, a vagrant. Trespass laws originate from this idea that African-Americans only belong in certain spaces and at certain times. 
And so they give police officers the ability, under the guise of law, to dictate where an African-American person can be, what time they can be there, and how they can operate in certain spaces. My kids' daycare was inside of one of the buildings to the um, Skyway, so I figured I'd take a walk, find somewhere to sit down, and um, wait on them to get there. I'm going to New Horizons to pick up my kids. I was sitting there for 10 minutes. That's when Rodolphus was standing in the train yard when he was grabbed by the sheriff's deputy. Monroe stated that he had not committed any crime. Wait, wait. You're gonna go to jail. I'm not doing anything yeah. wrong. Hold on. Can you Hold on. please? I'm not no, no, come on, brother. Hold on, I'm not, Can I'm you not your please? Brother. This is assault. At this moment, I saw my children's daycare class and their teachers and everything um, walking past while this was happening. He took the taser and drove it into my leg and pretty much at that point lost all control of the leg. The deputy later claimed that the crime committed by Dolphus was taking a 25 cent tin of fish from the lunch pail of a southern railway worker. Unable to provide any evidence to support this, the charge was changed to vagrancy. And I kept asking them what I was being charged with. They'll create false charges just to make sure that everything is perpetuated. Judge Longshore found Dolphus guilty of misdemeanor vagrancy and sentenced him to five months and 20 days of hard labor in the mines of Tennessee Coal, Iron, and Railroad. Going back to the vagrancy laws of the late 19th century, the people who make those laws have in mind another group of people for whom there is an inherent threat to their livelihood, like breaking barbecue ordinances in public parks or sleeping in dormitories that white people don't think you live there. I have every right to call the police. It allows law enforcement to regulate whether or not certain behavior for one group of people is deemed uh, criminal and another group of people uh, is just frivolous activity. Many people remember the Starbucks debacle in Philadelphia. There were two African-American men at a Starbucks. The employee had them arrested for loitering, where they're clearly not engaging in that behavior. Loitering is a police tool of choice. It's the go-to offense that police often use to impose their authority. In the misdemeanor system, there is no conduct too minor, no act too small, that the state cannot render a crime. Black people charged with a misdemeanor are 75% more likely to be locked up than white people. You have to realize that these laws didn't happen by chance. They were part of a, uh, a system to continue to oppress black bodies. Our misdemeanor system includes all kinds of offenses, and some of them can be quite serious. Domestic violence, DUI, but most of the time, we treat minor, harmless conduct as misdemeanors, traffic offenses, jaywalking, order maintenance offenses, spitting, driving on a suspended license for failure to pay a fines. And yet, these minor, meaningless misdemeanors can have terrible consequences for individuals. To understand the misdemeanor system, follow the money. The accused are paying for the judges, the prosecutors, and the this public made more than three and a half million dollars off phone calls. Commissary at the jail, it's a no money maker. They call it the $20 I'm a family member, transfers money in jail. Pocketing leftover feet. money the from the inmates' about food dollars a month. In they are sales. a controversial food vendor with a big fraud, state contract. Waste and and abuse. Aramark is the company that uses inmate workers. Today's system is estimated at $80 billion. The misdemeanor side of it, it is a way of saddling people with fines and fees that will put money in the pockets of the administrators of that system. The first time I got a ticket, my insurance had lapsed. So I got the speeding ticket and I got a no insurance ticket at the same time. The next time I got pulled over, I was arrested for driving with a suspended license. I paid the tickets, paid the court costs, paid my fees and fines, but they said for driving with a suspended license, the punishment for that is we're gonna suspend your license for two years. I would often have to choose between paying my inspection or my registration or paying my light bill or other bills that I had. I had to drive my car to get to work because I had a construction job. If I needed to take material to the job, I couldn't take plywood or two by fours on a bus. 
I felt like there was no way I was gonna be able to take care of the kids on my own while you were out because I didn't know how long you were gonna be in jail. This officer saw me, a young Hispanic guy driving a 63 Impala and said, you know what, that guy, he's up to something. I was trying to go to work, trying to pay bills, and he's treating me like a hardened criminal. That misdemeanor charge ended up becoming something that I couldn't get rid of. They are being treated as revenue sources charged daily fees for being in jail, supervision fees, tether fees, drug testing fees, database fees to fund bail bondsmen, private probation companies, electronic monitoring companies, drug testing companies. It is disturbingly similar to the way that we saw African-Americans being exploited in the post-war South. I'm the Mario Davis, uh, linebacker for the New Orleans Saints. I was born and raised in Mississippi, pretty much raised by a single mom. Entering into my second year of college, me and a teammate were caught shoplifting groceries from, from Walmart. It kind of felt a lot more like a drug bust than uh, <laughs> um, us having stole some groceries. The bail was set at $10,000, and you know, I didn't have $10,000. The football coaches bailed us out. A misdemeanor, you're supposed to be able to uh, be in front of the judge within 90 days, but this is not happening. This is not happening in our country. We have people who are spending seven, eight months in jail who have not even been sentenced. Cop arrested me and I was charged with the misdemeanor. The term chain gang was coined on account of the shackle worn by convict laborers. They said, okay, listen, we're gonna let you go home now, but Scram's gonna come and uh, put a monitor on you. They were taken to an anvil where a rivet was pounded into the ankle cuffs to keep them closed. Then the cuffs were chained together. The initial fee to get on the scram was $250. That's just to have it put on. Then after that, they charged me $220 a month for the actual monitor. Many of the convicts suffered from shackle sores, ulcers where the iron ground against their skin. Gangrene and other infections were also common. Right after they put it on me, they start causing these really severe sores and rashes, and their attitude pretty much is, it's court ordered, it's by a judge, and you'll wear it, or you can go back to jail. The emaciated convict laborers worked their entire days barefoot, but the shackles were always on their ankles. They mined in them, slept in them, and those who died of disease or beatings were buried in them. What they're doing is unjust. What they're doing is profiteering, because you, you're paying them. You're their slave with their shackle on your foot. I remember this hopeless feeling just overcome me. I couldn't take care of my family. The biggest misconception about misdemeanors is that they are minor. The full consequences of getting a misdemeanor can be astronomical. It hurt me for 10 years, and it completely disrupted my life. And I have been trying to figure out how to get my life back on track. This will be a part of my story for the rest of my life. When people are booked into jails for a week or a year or even a day, you just cannot avoid the trauma that inflicts upon you. The moment you hit the jail, you don't come out of that unchanged or untouched. 
You witness trauma, you witness violence, and it changes you. It changes your community. I tried to get a job at Amazon where my roommate worked. I called to Walmart and I called to several other retail stores. I got turned away because I had a misdemeanor charge for theft. Not enough people talk about what it means to have a misdemeanor on your record. It can determine the kind of job that you get, to the kind of housing that you can qualify for, to the kind of schools that you can go to. A lot of people are harmed for life because of the smallest infractions. They're being rendered homeless. They're going without food, without medication. Their children are suffering. Due to misdemeanors, I lost my housing. Shortly after that, I lost my vehicle, which led to me losing my job. And it was just one thing after another, like, like kicks to the face. I had full custody of my children. They had to get to school. We had to sleep in the car, waking up at like four in the morning, getting to a laundromat to make sure that they have clean school uniforms. I had worked so hard and all of that was ruined by one charge. One misdemeanor ruined my ability to get even just basic work. They can't get a job if they have to check a box that says they've been convicted of a crime. They can't even rent housing because they got poor credit when they received a ridiculous $500 speeding violation. So this system was designed both to extract from people, but also to marginalize their presence in society. It's gonna be a mass grave site. This is the dormitory. The stupid crowd, these are the beds. They right beside each other, and this is the space. Everybody just dying and getting sick and shit, like this shit is serious as fuck. Bro, you all right? Mm -mm. You want me to go get the police? No. What have you done, this bitch? You ain't gonna do nothing about it. <laughs> this motherfucker literally in this bitch dying, bro. I don't know what to do. One of the worst places to be during this pandemic is locked up in jail. The judge never said, I'm sending you to prison to die. The same horror story is emerging of the unchecked spread of infection and inmates essentially being left to die. Now jaywalking or theft of a small amount or any sort of vagrancy type of um, behavior can lead to your incarceration and eventual contracting of the virus and death. I've been in jail for two and a half months for petty theft a nonviolent crime that carries a misdemeanor charge for the price value of um, less than $100. There's been three deaths, two being inmates, one being a guard. As far as like people who are working for the facility, they're like intertwined. They could easily be catching it. That's how one of the guards caught it. My life is in danger. These human beings aren't valued enough for us to apply the same kinds of safety measures there that we are in other sectors of society. If it wasn't already bad enough that you are booked into jail because you didn't have the money to pay the ticket and your license is suspended, that is now life-threatening to you. Sheriff's Office is now releasing nonviolent inmates as a next step in mitigating the spread of COVID-19. Hundreds of inmates have been released from Shelby County's jail in an effort to put fewer people at risk for coronavirus. Inmates a total of 38 inmates are ordered to go. They were inmates. Their time is up. Now they're freed people. Because of COVID-19, thousands of misdemeanor defendants are rightly being released. It's clear that these individuals should have never been incarcerated in the first place. Um, we can tell by the fact that after these releases, we haven't seen any sort of crime wave. There's a different type of crime wave that should concern us, though, and that's the crime of violence against black people post-Civil War.
State violence has historically been used to intimidate people of color, especially black people. We see this all throughout history. Misdemeanors, they have almost nothing to do with public safety. What misdemeanors do is give police an extraordinary amount of discretion with any minor offense premised on the idea that the black man is a threat. Misdemeanors are a very specific mechanism that legalize violence toward black people and keep them in a very particular place, not just as individuals, but as an entire community of people. When we look at so many cases in history, often what started as an investigation or a claim of a petty misdemeanor offense led to police officer supported and sanctioned racial terrorism. All too often we see police exercising that terrible authority of violence against people who have only been suspected of the most minor of crimes. The problem isn't bad apple cops. The problem is the system is working the way it's supposed to. Police shot this boy outside my apartment. <laughs> they killed him. Gray appeared to be unable to walk and was screaming as he was carried, feet dragging on the ground, to a police van. I know, I know, you just saw your job. life could have so easily been taken in that skyway. George Floyd goes to show further that the most minor of offenses, even no offense at all, could result in death. The very purpose of racial terrorism is control, is social control. What we have seen in the killings of those accused was that misdemeanors became the gateway for police violence and murder. We are seeing decriminalization. We are seeing citations instead of arrests. We are seeing people let out of jail. We are seeing pushback against fines and fees. But at the same time, there is so much more work that needs to be done. Who defined what a misdemeanor is? The whole thing was built on exploitation, on racial violence, on building up industrial capitalism. We should not be locking up people who speed 
who are too poor to pay a fine or a fee, who loiter or trespass or jaywalk. They're not dangerous. They're not scary. There's never been a good reason to lock up anybody for petty offenses like slavery back in the day. The law itself is doing the work of oppression. The criminal law is providing the authority to arrest black people, to punish black people, to kill black people. And ultimately, the real crime is that we're black. Wow. Every time I watch this movie, uh, I find it more disturbing and I find it more upsetting um, for someone who really basically knew nothing about misdemeanors and how dangerous they are. It certainly opened my eyes and my understanding. And what I found powerful about the film is the contrast between looking at incidences that are happening today and showing you incidences that happened perhaps 50 years ago or 100 years ago. And it's really the same issue. Um, it's very concerning to see the mistreatment of people. It's very concerning to see the loss of life. Um, I was in a conference one, I'll go off uh, the program here for a moment. And something very powerful was asked. We were watching a different film. And before watching it, we were asked, uh, have you ever done anything that you could have been arrested for? And virtually everybody in the room raised their hand. And then the presenter asked, and how many of you were arrested? And virtually no one in the room raised their hand because the audience was predominantly white. And that really brought home to me, uh, I know I've gotten a speeding ticket, which was well-deserved, um, but I think in terms of, I was speeding, I was stopped, I got the ticket, it was well-deserved, I paid the fine, I went to school, but that's not everybody's option and that's not everybody's ability. I wonder before we go on, if I can ask you, Sharon, to just comment a moment or two on this film and perhaps share with us here is there anything that can be done about this system of misdemeanors and how it seems to be so abused? Hi, yeah, th thank you. You know, this is, watching this film is triggering. It's triggering for me because what may be new information to many communities, for me, it's just rehashing what I already know. You know, I have a black son and these are the kinds of things. In fact, I had a, a conversation with my brother who has a 15 year old son. And we were talking about how to prepare him because this 15 year old son will be driving soon. And um, I was encouraging my brother to watch these movies with him. And my brother says, well, I don't, you know, I don't want to um, have his experience of what life is like for him to be so colored by all this negativity. And I understand that. So what can we do? Well, one thing you can do is join organizations that are fighting against this. And the ACLU is one of those organizations. Carolina knows lots of organizations because I see her in so many meetings. Um, you've got to join this fight. Once you become educated, you cannot sit by and act like you don't know this. So um, there's you. plenty of resources that'll be offered later on. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. And now we're going to move on to our next speaker. I'm very pleased to introduce um, our second keynote speaker, Karen Tanunu Tauri. She is a former chief assistant district attorney right here in Santa Clara County and a volunteer attorney for the Northern California Innocence Project. Uh, and we're going to hear about some of her work tonight with the Innocence Project. But two of her many awards and accomplishments, she co-authored Hate Crimes, published by the California District Attorneys Association, 
and she coordinated the creation of the Santa Clara County Law Enforcement Child Abuse Protocol, the first of its kind in California to cover homicide, sexual and physical assault, kidnapping and neglect. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Karen. And now we'd like to hear about your work, particularly on the Innocence Project. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here tonight. And uh, these topics are difficult and so important. So thank you very much. Um, let me do my screen share moment here. And uh, here we go. So um, I am going to talk about three things tonight to get us all thinking about uh, criminal justice reform. And I'll start with me, one retired prosecutor's experience. I would like briefly to tell a story of one man's journey to justice and then one essential reform that I think is uh, not being discussed now and I believe it would be very important. And I'll give you a preview of that. I don't think that prosecutors really look at what goes wrong in order to prevent it from happening in the future. So first of all, I was with the Santa Clara County District Attorney's Office for 30 years. And in the early 2000s, when I was head of the homicide unit, an attorney came to me who was representing a man named Rick Walker. He had been convicted in Santa Clara County 12 years before. And she claimed that he was innocent of the murder that he had been convicted for. Well, I really thought this couldn't happen. I mean, you, you, we don't, in Santa Clara County, we don't prosecute innocent people. But she gave a fabulous presentation and I assigned the reinvestigation of the case to two homicide detectives who were working within the DA's office. And we just reopened the case and started from scratch. And after about four months of investigation, uh, I realized we had, can, we had caused the conviction of an innocent man. He spent 12 years in prison. His father died when he was in prison. Um, he didn't see his child for 12 years. And uh, of course we agreed to his release. Well, that story stuck with me and really changed my view of what a prosecutor can do right and wrong. And so when I retired, I went over to the Northern California Innocence Project and have volunteered there for the last eight years. And the first case I was given was the case of Jeremy Puckett, a man who had been convicted of murder out of Sacramento County. And uh, just this last year, he was finally found factual innocent. But let me give you a little bit about his journey to justice. And I will tell you the thing that really struck me is the case of Rick Walker and the case of Jeremy Puckett have so much in common. They're two black men. They, uh, Rick had a very uh, minor uh, criminal history as did Jeremy Puckett. I mean, I'll, I'll be frank about that. They were both employed people. Uh, they both had children. They were both African-American. They were both framed by liars who were given uh, bargains by the um, government. They both had witnesses testify against them who were released from jail early if they gave testimony. In both cases, the government hid evidence. In both cases, there, were no, there was no scientific evidence linking the individual to the murder. There were sloppy investigations. Both were by sheriff's departments. And they both had weak defenders of their cases. So the cases had a lot in common. 
This is Jeremy Puckett. This is, he was a, a young man in his early 20s when he was convicted. He always maintained his innocence. And uh, he fought before he contacted the Innocence Pro Project. He tried many of his own appeals. And the problem was he didn't have the ability to do any investigation while he was incarcerated. And he had run one appeal with an attorney. And when that failed, the state doesn't provide him with anything else. I'll tell you a little bit about the Northern California Innocence Project. It's part of a network throughout the United States. They're individual innocence projects and they take on uh, claims of innocence by, you have to be fully convicted and incarcerated before an innocence project will take your case. And in, in the case here for Northern California, we're affiliated with Santa Clara Law School. We work with the students for Jeremy's case, I enlisted the help of the law firm of Simpson Thatcher and also the Kachet law firm. They both supplied uh, the money we needed and um, lots of young talent for the legal writing. The two women in the middle are uh, Kuki Rodolfi and Linda Starr. They started this Innocence Project about 18 years ago. And how sad to know that they have exonerated at least one inmate a year since they've been doing this work. And this is one sad fact that you can hardly go a week in this country without reading about someone who has been wrongfully convicted and lost 10, 20, 30, 40 years of their life. Um, I was very fortunate to have Don Anders who had been a deputy chief at San Jose Police Department assist me with the investigation because this investigation truly took us three full years and then we went into litigation mode. And of course, our client was um, incarcerated, moved to different prisons, but um, we, I visited him as much as I could and we corresponded and he was fantastic in helping us with this investigation. So the, the crime started really at a drug house. And I'll be, I'll be very uh, brief about it because it's factually a complex case, but um, th there were a number of people coming and going in this drug house. Now, my client, the man here in green with the pee on his shirt, he, P Puckett, never used drugs. He never sold drugs, he never used drugs, but he had a friend he had known since high school uh, named Israel Sepp here with the man with the S on his shirt. And he, Sepp called him that night and said, hey, come on over to this house. And Jeremy went to the house. And when he got there, there was a young man there named Anthony Galati who uh, was trying to buy drugs. And he was a young white man. And Jeremy thought the whole situation was strange. And he actually believed that this Galati kid was somehow an undercover cop. And he said, I'm out of here. He left and, and he went to a barbecue. We, we had, um, he had an alibi for later that night. Uh, four people uh, had attested to where he was. But unbeknownst to Jeremy, uh, two other people showed up at this drug house, a man and a woman. The woman is someone who would do set up robberies and she was dropped there by a man named J-Mo and he left. And, and so Jeremy never thought anything more about that evening. Just now, it never, he, he knew he'd, he'd been there for about 10 minutes, saw the young kid, this isn't good, and he left. Well, unbeknownst to Jeremy, this kid was found March 14th, 1998, uh, on the side of the road with two bullet holes in the back of his head someone driving by noticed the body. So the police started investigating this case and they really didn't have any clues as to what happened. A few weeks later, the young woman I mentioned who had been at the drug house, she was found murdered in the American River. Uh, she'd been stabbed 12 times and she was uh, floating in the river. Well, the, the media, decided that these two crimes were committed. 
because this young woman hung out in the vicinity of the apartment in Rancho Cordova, uh, where the young man had bought drugs. So that they just decided, the media did, that this, these, were, these two crimes were committed by the same person. And, and the detectives took on that assumption themselves. And so right away we have cops who have a, they, they make an assumption. They don't investigate and gather facts. They're gonna fit facts with that assumption. They've got a bias to start with. And the case went cold. They didn't have anything. But in 1999, Sepp, the man who had called Jeremy over, Sepp knew even though he was in prison on a gun charge, totally unrelated to this drug house, Sepp called the detectives and said, I know who committed the murder. I was there that night. And he immediately got a plea deal. And the, the, uh, the police made a deal with him and he told a story which uh, blamed Jeremy Puckett for this murder. Now, Jeremy Puckett was arrested and he was so confused. I wish we had time tonight to show the tape of when he's told he's being charged with murder because he simply doesn't understand it. It's something he, he didn't even know this kid had been killed. And now it's hard for him to even figure out what day it is. Um, but he was assigned a defender and they did an investigation and they learned two things, important things. Jeremy had an alibi. He had four people who could put him where he was after he left the house. They knew what time it was. They had reasons for knowing that. And when the liar was um, interviewed by the defender, he recanted. So pretrial, great evidence, an alibi and a recantation. But when it came time for trial, the attorney did not put that evidence on. So, Jeremy was convicted. He was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for the murder of Anthony Galati. Now, we did an investigation, as I said. We tromped all over California. We, we were very thorough. We found a woman who told us, oh yeah, this, this other guy, this third party, he admitted to me that he did the murder and Jeremy wasn't there. And lo and behold, it was the man who dropped the young woman off at the apartment. So it was a setup robbery. We discovered that the investigators who assumed that both murders were committed by the same person had commingled reports. And because of that, the young woman's murder file had documents relevant to Jeremy's case that he never saw. There were 700 pages of evidence that was not handed over to Jeremy Puckett's attorney. There was a gun connected to this that was not handed over to Jeremy's attorney. So the prosecutor and the sheriff hid evidence. Furthermore, we realized that the date of the murder was wrong. He was convicted of murder for the wrong date. So the, the failure of the government was immense in this case. His attorney let him down. The prosecutor let him down. The sheriffs were negligent. And he was convicted on that and spent 19 years wow. in custody for something he didn't do. So... Here's a curious thing. And as I started out saying, we read about this every week. When there's a plane crash in America, what happens? There's a complete investigation about what went wrong because we don't wanna lose lives. When a doctor operates on the wrong leg, there's grand, grand rounds. No, doctors don't want to hurt other people. When there's a forest fire, there's a complete investigation. What went wrong? But when there's a wrongful conviction, I don't know about any DA's office who's done a full grand, ra grand round 
to inform their staff what went wrong. S Sacramento DAs fought us on this for four years, even up to the innocence hearing in January that we won. And after that, they still have not told their staff how Jeremy Puckett lost 19 years of his life. So we know that this happens and I believe that prosecutors and police need to take the time to dissect these wrongful convictions in hopes of preventing it from happening. And those are my thoughts for tonight. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, this was certainly a different perspective on the need for criminal justice reform. So we saw the film, well, first we started with Sharon sharing her information and tracing it back, way back in history. Then we watched the film and the tremendously negative impacts of misdemeanors and how misdemeanors can be used as a tool. And then listening to you and watching your slides, watching how uh, the justice system can unjustly convict a man and sentence him to death, which certainly just adds to that whole picture of the criminal justice system and the things that must happen to improve it. I wonder, I do have a question for you, Karen. I had heard that there's some kind of a reconciliation committee or like, that's probably the wrong word, like investigation committee in many DA's offices now where they look at past cases. Um, that's think. true. There, there are, there, there, um, conviction integrity units in many district attorney's offices. Okay. And they often, um, Sacramento has one and that it, because they had one, they allowed me to go into their files. However, they do not train their attorneys on what went wrong. Uh, that okay. there is no great overview of what went wrong with the case. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So many of them do have that. And of course, I mean, this is, this is to be expected, but you go to places like um, Santa Clara, San Francisco, Los Angeles, they're much more open-minded and understanding because it's more liberal communities and the more conservative communities like Sacramento, Fresno, the Valley, um, they're much more resistant to accepting responsibility for a wrongful conviction. Mm -hmm. But imagine if your doctor just fought you all the way right. after the wrong leg had been operated on. Exactly. It, it's ridiculous. Exactly, exactly. You know, I'm going to, before I, I turn it over to Carolina for just a moment, I wonder if um, you mentioned that one thing that you thought had to happen, and that was communicating with or training their staff or educating their staff in DA's offices about what went wrong in the past so that it doesn't continue. Was that, that was your one yes. area? Yes, it is. Yes. 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 Um, I want, in Santa Clara County, don't they have one of those uh, committees in the DA's office? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, you know, watching all of this again, and I go back to Sharon and what you said a few minutes ago, and I think Carolina will add to this, you know, the question is, what can we do about this? I mean, we watch this film that is so disturbing and upsetting. We listen, we look at statistics, and we know, yes, there are problems. There is terrible problems in the criminal justice system. And myself and along with many others wanna know what can we do about this? I mean, number one, we need to learn about it. We need to educate ourselves. As I said, when I watched that movie the first time I was absolutely just shocked because I never knew that information. So now I'm going, I'm happy to thank you, Karen. I'm gonna introduce Carolina. Great. And uh, she is our third keynote speaker tonight. She's a retired elementary school curriculum coordinator and the LWVC, the state co-chair of their criminal justice committee. She's a member of the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles who worked on its youth outreach and human trafficking committees and is currently involved with monitoring the LA City Council redistricting, 
and chair of the League of Women Voters of LA Committee on Criminal Justice Reform. She was integrally involved in establishing the state, the LWVC's position on criminal justice. So welcome, Carolina, and we're eager to hear from you. And I know that you're going to share with us too things about how people can get involved. Thank you. Thanks so much for inviting me to talk with you about what the League is doing to help our help, help reform our criminal justice system. Oh, I see I need to move my screen a bit. Okay. There we go. Good. Thank you, Sharon, for pointing out how much there is to be done. The documentary Racially Charged uncovers our cruel and ineffective misdemeanor system. I've asked Eleanor to share with you a list of resources. One of them is Debug, nearby in San Jose and Silicon Valley, which uses the strategy of participatory defense to teach families and friends of people going through the court system how to support their loved one for the best possible outcome. What Karen shared makes me proud that the Los Angeles District Attorney, George Gascon, has established a conviction integrity unit in spite of all the pushback he's been receiving. There are people languishing in prison who should be, who should be contributing to their families and friends. As you may know, the League has traditionally not been a leader in the area of justice reform. Our brand is voting rights and fair elections. Rather, we partner with other organizations working towards safety and justice for all. LWVUS does not have a criminal justice position, but prior to the adoption of the League of Women Voters California's criminal justice position in 2019, these are the national positions that allowed state and local leagues to take action and do advocacy, death penalty, sentencing, which is also alternatives to incarceration, violence prevention, individual liberties, meeting basic human needs, voting rights, gun policy, and human trafficking. Even though the criminal justice is largely a state and local issue, the League has stepped up to be heard on the national stage. LWVUS adopted an urgent resolution entitled Racial Justice for Black People and People of Color at the 2020 convention. Let me read one statement and one resolution from the two page document. We recognize the crisis that exists as a result of racism and socioeconomic inequalities that have marginalized, discriminated against, and harmed Black people and all people of color. Education, housing, employment, healthcare, and every aspect of American life have been impacted. We resolve that the Lee advocates against systemic racism in the justice system and at minimum to prevent excessive force and brutality by law enforcement. We also call for prompt actions by all league members to advocate within every level of government to eradicate systemic racism and the harm it causes. LWVUS has supported the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. LWVUS signed on to a coalition letter asking President Biden to end the federal funding of police in schools. LWV California adopted a criminal justice position at their convention in 2019. This is the LWV California criminal justice position in brief. The League of Women Voters of California supports a criminal justice system that is just, effective, equitable, transparent, and that fosters public trust at all stages. The elimination of systemic bias, 
policing practices that promote safety for both law enforcement officers and the communities they serve. Collaboration between government and community. A focus on humane treatment and rehabilitation with the goal of promoting the successful reentry into communities of those who have been incarcerated. And reliance on evidence-based research in decision-making. We were advised to phrase things in general language in order to build flexibility for future changes. For example, if we named body cameras in our position in the next few years, that technology could be obsolete. A three-page position includes some specific language in the following categories, policing practices, pretrial procedures, tent sentencing, incarceration, and reentry. Please take some time to review the whole position. We also realize the position doesn't cover everything we may want to address, and we will do necessary research in order to update the position in the future. Have you ever looked at LWV California's bill status report? I'm leaving my slides to take you to the League of Women Voters website. So at the very top, when you click on bill status report, you're gonna see a list of all of the bills that the League of Women Voters has taken positions on. I'm clicking on criminal justice so that you can see names of bills we've supported or opposed, their authors, the summaries of the bills, the letters we sent to each committee as the bills made their way through the legislator, legislature and the result. Here we note that a bill we co-sponsored, AB 256, the Racial Justice Act for All, and several bills we supported, such as AB 329, bail reform, did not make it through the Senate Appropriations Committee to the floor vote. We expect these bills to come back in January. Happily, California now joins, I'm scrolling down to one that we did get passed, we now join 46 other states in establishing a law, SB2, police decertification, which would prevent an officer with a record of serious misconduct from applying to work in another law enforcement agency in California. This was one of the bills that last year did not make it to the governor's desk, but it became one of those two-year bills that we were able to pass. You just have to stick with it. Be on the lookout from your league who's going to alert you as to the right time to lobby your legislatures, your legislators for their vote on important criminal bills, criminal justice bills. This is your advocacy team. Before you launch a project, be sure you communicate with your board. The, the Criminal Justice Committee is a good thinking partner. You may also want to talk with LWV California leaders like Position Director Ashley Rabache, Social Policy Director Susan Rice, Board Vice President for Advocacy Gloria Chan Hu, and Deputy Director Dora Rose. Are you ready to get involved? The work is challenging and rewarding. Our Criminal Justice Local League Toolkit is a place to start. Observing commission, city council, or county supervisor meetings regarding local police and sheriffs is easy. One of the best things that the league does is to shine a light on what government is doing. Our toolkit has information and training links for Observer's Core. The League of Women Voters Los Angeles started its Criminal Justice Committee seven years ago by doing a lot of reading, books, research reports like the President's Report on 21st Century Policing and research from Stanford University and the California Public Policy Institute. We met with leaders in the area of public safety, the police chief, 
director of constitutional policing and policy, director of education and training, the inspector general, police commissioners, ACLU, Youth Justice Coalition, and the Social, Com Social Justice Committee at Ward AME Church. Who else do you know in your area who's concerned with justice reform? The toolkit has a link to the Criminal Justice Google Discussion Group, which posts meetings of our Criminal Justice Committee, which takes place every fourth Tuesday of the month. You can join other local leagues in California that are working in coalitions to support the implementation of AB 392, use of force policy, and SB 1185, sheriff accountability. One of the public forums that the League of Women Voters of Los Angeles organized was about strengthening trust between police and community. And another was focused on what exactly does the district attorney do? If you like research and writing, LWV California is in need of your skills. Our advocacy is limited to the number of bills we are able to analyze. With more volunteers, we would be able to support or oppose more legislation. In March of 2020, League members joined with members of other organizations to lobby legislators in Sacramento for the Racial Justice Act. We had breakfast together to plan. Then in small groups, we visited offices of state assembly members and senators. We held a press conference on the steps of the Capitol in the afternoon and celebrated together over dinner. There is a lobby day planned for February 1st of 2022 to convince lawmakers to make the Racial Justice Act retroactive. If something is deemed unjust as of January 2022, it is also unjust prior to that time. I hope you'll consider joining us. And now I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Carolina. I'm looking over here at the chat and I'm kind of surprised that we don't have a lot of questions. I think perhaps uh, people are responding similar to how I am that there's been so much information tonight shared by each one of our speakers. And I'm beginning to think that each aspect of our program tonight could lead to another whole series of how we should work on criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Uh, tonight was kind of just like a primer, getting into the subject for many and learning so many of the, of the aspects related to it. You know, my overarching question all the time is, you know, how do we get involved? And maybe the question is, where do we begin? Sometimes the issues that I've seen tonight seem so overwhelming, they're so big. I mean, what's a most effective first step besides just educating yourself? Learning about it, of course, is critical. But as a citizen in this county, you know, what's a what's a reasonable, what not not even the word reasonable. I mean, what's a, what would be an effective first step uh, that something I could do to get more involved in this issue? And I wonder if each one of you just very quickly, because we really don't have a whole lot of questions, uh, could just respond to that. What do you think would be something I could do tomorrow that would be the beginning of my working on this issue uh, more closely here in Santa Clara County? Well, I think, I think you need to, because this is such a broad topic. Yes that you really have to pick the topic that touches your heart first. You really do. And that, that might be something very small, but you know, it's, it's writing to your um, a council person. It's reaching out to the people that can make those <laughs> policy changes. If it's local, it's the council person. If mm. it's statewide, it's a Senator. But I think you have to, for me personally, it was, being concerned about people who are incarcerated who didn't commit a crime. Yeah. And, and so I acted on the one thing that touched me knowing you can't, you can't take care of everything. So that's my thought to identify what, 
what you truly care about, number one, doesn't mean you don't care about the other things, but what rises to the top? Thank you. That's really good advice. I wonder, uh, Sharon or Carolina, would you like to respond to Sharon? Yes, yes. So yes, you're right, um, Karen, this is, uh, it, it can be overwhelming thinking about the many ways um, that we um, allow injustice to exist in our justice system. But, you know, the United States uh, pretty much for, uh, for most of its existence has been an apartheid state. It was an apartheid state for longer than South Africa. And when South Africa abolished its apartheid system and Nelson Mandela became president, one of the things he decided to do was to have a period of truth and reconciliation. And we've never done that in this country. So when I showed you guys that slide that talked about slavery and then we had the black codes and then we had debt peonage and then we had, and it just goes on and on and on and on because what we continue to see is the resurgence of actions that are rooted in deeply ignorant and deep ignorance about the history of this country and people who have confidence that they believe that they they know they they know that these people must must have done something wrong mm -hmm. you know there was a there was a judge um in, in missouri that was looking at the ferguson um debacle and he said that perceptions of african americans as dangerous different or subordinate are lessons that we've all learned not just white people all people in the united states and beyond have learned and internalized these messages about african americans being dangerous different or subordinate and for most of us this belief system is outside of our awareness. Mm -hmm. And that's where the greatest danger is because most people aren't these vicious racists. My experience has been that that actually represents a minority of Americans, but yet we all internalize these messages that serve as a platform that all of these injustices are sitting on top of. So I think that we really need to begin by educating ourselves, using the resources. Brave New Films has a fabulous set of resources, mm -hmm. questions, answers to those questions. If you go to Brave New Films, and by the way, you should join Brave New Films. They ask for like a $5 donation. Um, Robert Greenwald is fabulous. That's not the only film. He's, he just does an awesome yeah. Yeah. So. That's my two cents. Thank you very much, uh, Sharon. And by the way, I just did join Brave New Films. <laughs> they were wonderful. It was easy and it was uh, a really, um, they were so helpful immediately. I was surprised. So yes. And Carolina, do you want to wrap it up? Sure. Thank you, Eleanor, for that question. Um, three things immediately came to my mind. Um, one is what I mentioned, uh, something called Observer's Core. If you go and sit in a police commission meeting and some municipalities don't have commissions, but they have city council meetings that discuss what's happening with the police. Um, I do that occasionally. I don't do it every time because it happens weekly and it's very time um, intensive. But the last meeting I attended, the chief said uh, in his report, he makes a report every time, 54% um, of our officers are vaccinated. I was horrified. Mm -hmm. That means 46% of the officers running around Los Angeles are putting people at risk. So, you know, you find out about something that you care about, just like Karen said. And because we had set, uh, because we had established a relationship with the chief of police, I was able to write him a letter and let him know, I'm sure I'm not the only one, or we, the league is not the only one that reached out to him. Soon after his report, an LA Times article came out about that. But um, so the second thing that came to my mind was develop a relationship with mm. people who are doing work in the justice area. Um, and they need to know what you care about. You need to know what they care about. The league, as I said earlier, is not a leader in this area. 
there are other groups that are doing on the ground um, really tough work that we can support. We are in a supportive role. Um, and the third thing that came to my mind was there are ready projects. Um, if you go to the League of Women Voters Criminal Justice Toolkit, there are lists of projects that are ongoing right now. And two of them I know you would be interested in. One is holding law enforcement agencies accountable for AB 392. And it seems to me, Sharon, was a year ago, I think you were on a panel or, or you helped with that panel. I remember seeing you there on um, how do we hold our police accountable for the new law that says you may not kill someone unless it's absolutely necessary. Policies previous to this have said you may kill someone if it's reasonable. There's a big difference. And so um, people around the state, and I do mean leagues, local leagues, are partnering with local organizations to meet with their law enforcement agencies to uh, Im impress upon them the importance of, of changing their policy, mm. meet the law. Um, so those are the things that come to my mind and um, happy to talk to anyone. My email address is going to be in the uh, handout that you share with everyone. Yes. Thanks, Eleanor, so much for- Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you all so much. It's been, uh, just an incredible program, enlightening program. And let me now switch back to our PowerPoint where we can share with our audience uh, the list of resources that we do have. And I think you know that uh, everybody who is registered for the event gets sent a link to the recording. And also you will be given links to the presentations uh, from each one of the speakers. But again, when we have a program like this, many people, including myself, always say, well, now that I know about this, what do I do about this? And you know, the first recommendation is to first of all, educate yourself. Um, the film, uh, Racially Charged America's Misdemeanor Problem was based on a novel, Punishment Without Crime. And we actually saw the author during the film, Alexandra Natapoff. Uh, another book that's not listed here, which I wish I had, was The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. That book really opened my eyes. Uh, I say become informed about and participate in local issues about criminal justice reform. For example, a current issue right here in Santa Clara County is, should the county build a new jail? <clears throat> or should that money be utilized for different social services, perhaps mental health services, facilities, counselors? And there are two groups that are very active right now who are working on this issue and providing feedback to the Board of Supervisors who are going to vote on this issue on November 16th. And I've put the links into here, Put Care First in Santa Clara County and their link. And a group called Surge Showing Up for Racial Justice is also very involved in this practice. They have a campaign going on now where uh, something they ask you to do every day for the next six days. Okay, the next slide, please. And lastly, and we will add on to this, uh, Carolina very nicely provided us with an extensive list of resources that can be uh, accessed at this website here. Let's see if we can pull it up. And I'll just show you quickly what's here. Some books, uh, the LBUS impact on issues, different statements. Uh, if we could scroll down the criminal justice position, most importantly, to certainly take a look at the justice, the LWVC criminal justice toolkit and research from all of these different organizations that are also available to you. So let's go back now to the regular slide. And uh, we'll be adding one or two things here that came up during this webinar tonight. We'll be adding it to this list here, uh, a contact for the Innocence Project, if you're interested in that. And I think, Sharon, you also had a contact for me. I have it written down in my notes that will be listed here. And so now I would like to turn it back to our president, Sophia Cow. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. And uh, really thank you our three speakers, Sharon, Karen, and uh, Carolina for your time. 
and that we may gain such an insight on this very heavy topic tonight. So as Eleanor said, we will upload tonight's presentation to our website shortly and a follow-up email which contains the presentation resources and the recording will be sent to those who register for the event. Next page. Yeah, here I would like to announce a, a in-person holiday party. This is the first time you know, after pandemic that we're going to host the holiday party in the first Sunday of December. And it will be held in a very beautiful a retreat center in Los Gatos. It's called Green Mountain Retreat. It only costs $25 per person and $40 for two person to enjoy a full lunch meal and use of the whole facility. So uh, if you're interested in learning more about our league, getting to know our board member, and uh, we're also really looking forward to celebrating the party with our friends and community member and our league members. Please follow the link to register Okay, it is on the first weekend of the Sunday. Okay, so, so uh, feel free to use this link to connect with us and subscribe to our newsletter. Okay, so thank you so much. That's all for tonight. Thank you for your time to attend tonight's event. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you.